Thank you, Freak. And I feel like we have to touch on it immediately. It was successful in the first game. Not so successful in the third game. Gambit found a way to deal with it. The Fizz pick. Yeah, you know, he went AD tank Fizz the first game. Switched it up completely to full-on AP Fizz this time around. But the level one was the kind of thing that slowed him down quite a bit. And that slowed the entire team down. But really interesting to see him switch the build up, especially with a non-AP mid. Now, since they had Italian, goes for the AP Fizz, and his mastery is twenty-eight and two. Twenty-eight and two, yeah. It's just yeah. kind of, it's just kind of crazy. It makes you, <laughs> makes you question, makes you question some of the decisions making there. Uh, Dominic, you talked about the level one in the last game having a huge impact on the game. I feel like this one had maybe, possibly, an even greater impact because it seemed a little ri more than a little risky, I should say. Oh uh, yeah, it was a really strange level one. I, I didn't really understand how it was going to go down because you had Gambit coming from all sides and like flanking in a five man level one, which is weird because normally you think that the team that is grouped as five will have the advantage because they're, they didn't have much AOE. Like it was like a charm, a hook stuff that you aren't really afraid of if you're all grouped together. But the charm came right on Tristana at the end of like the pack. So they were able to get a lot of damage on the range champion, which is really big because in that level one fight they had three melee champions and one and two range champions. And one of the range champions is getting chunked super low off that. So I think that, that um hurt them a lot. And uh I think that the the level one turning out the way it did dictated the pace of the game. I think another thing about the level one that was really huge, it was two for one, but Ryze ended up getting a kill. And since he started with a mana crystal, he was able to come out with a tier in his first buy. In the 2v1 swap, he can start stacking that tier right from the get-go. So he's not set behind at all in terms of his item build, just a little bit in the farm. So he's able to start stacking tier right from the get-go, which is huge for Ryze, which is able to to power him through the lane swap phase and just eventually outshine the Maokai. Yeah, the early stacking. And the Monterey Gen, just absolutely insane start for Rise. But Dominate, you mentioned the fact that they had three melee champions, one of which was Talon. Yep. What do we think about that Talon mid pick? Because when we were back here discussing, we thought there were some other options against yeah, Ari. I, th I think I was wrong. I think it was four melee champions, right? Wasn't it Braum, Maokai, yeah. you're right. Fizz, you're and right. Talon? So there's four melee champions, which means that if you're if you're AD champion, your one range champion goes down first. It's so hard to win the fight because you have hooks and charms coming from everywhere. You have all these like auto attacks and like rise cues coming in that you need to like get on somebody and give them to in order to win the, the level one. And since they weren't able to do that, since they got engaged on, it just made it really hard. Ari flashed a wall and wasn't uh, in combat anymore. She actually missed two more charms after that, but it didn't even matter because of how uh, how their team comp worked at that stage of the game. I think that a Syndra pick would have been completely the best pick by far in that game because Syndra does extremely well against Ari, and then low range mages like uh, Rice, low range AD carry Lucian, Kazix is gonna die get one shot instantly. Like Thresh can kill that champion as well. Syndra would have been phenomenal in that situation, but I think they shot away from it just because the previous game, he did not look comfortable on that champion. So definitely some jitters then from yep. the first yeah. game. Which, so, actually talk to me about that. When you, just as players, if you have an unsuccessful game on a champion in a, in a best of five series, are you really tentative to go back to it, or is that is that something that you just have to work on? You have to get better at saying, no, I know my ability to play this champion, I can jump back on it. I think the most important thing is if you fail with a champion, you need to uh, assess yourself and see why that champion failed. Did it? Did you have a poor level one? Did you struggle in laning phase? Like, were you not feeling well? What exactly happened? Did you actually not play the champion? Are you not comfortable with it? And if the answer is, yeah, you're not comfortable with the champion, just accept it. Don't play the champion anymore. It's it's that easy. You can't afford to just play something that is good, but you're not comfortable with in, in the match of such high stakes. To that end, Dominate, we throw statistics around all the time when we talk about win rates for certain players on certain champions. How much of that actually factors into your decision making as a player when you're looking at a champion? Uh, it's all about just comfort. Like I, I know this split personally. I had a terrible win rate on Eve in the early part of the split, and everyone on Reddit's like, oh, you're the worst Eve in the world. But I personally felt super comfortable on the champion, so I just kept on picking it. If you are comfortable on a champion, you should take that over all the results, in my mind. Uh, you should be able to, to separate what happened in the game from your actual skill. Because if you botch a level 1 and you lose a game level 1, yeah, your champion's going to look bad. It's not going to feel good. But if you know your ability on a champion, you need to stick to it. And you just have to be really um, critical and gauge it. I think that his Syndra wasn't the best in game in game 2. Or, yeah, in game 2. But I think that... 
I think if he just adapted God Ignite and played it into such a profitable matchup, it would have been fine. Like, he wasn't playing it into a Zed with, like, a Vi. He wasn't in a weird situation. He was just going to play a straight-up lane phase. Syndra versus Ari. Uh, not incredible jungle pressure on either side, and he should be able to win that matchup. All right, to that end, I love the connection that you made there. We're going to jump into our replay, which is about 32, 33 minutes into the game around the Baron pit, where SK, it seems like a fairly good pick. They choose a good fight, but there's a, a, a couple positioning errors and things like that, and they actually, again, the melee issue p seems to plague them. So, Crumbs, I'll let you take this one. I think a key part of this replay is the fact that if you notice the map, Gambit has three pink wars in the Baron area, while SK has only that one green ward in the left side brush of mid lane. So they're going into this almost blind once Gambit retreats from that brush. And then it starts with the Brahma, it hits Ari. Maokai flashes to try to get Ari, but she picks up the lantern right at the last finish. They finish Rise here with a fish, and then during the charm, Tristana gets hit. Now she should have rocket jumped away immediately, but she just kind of danced around. She had the opportunity to rocket jump into the race and get away. She ends up getting killed, and then now you just can't Thresh Box basically single-handedly soloed the remaining four melees in the team because Talon used his gap closer on the rise. They all blew everything for him. They can't come into the fight. They just don't have any more gap closers due to the, the team comp that they have. And then right here with Ari's build, she went with the yeah, Zanyas and the Rhylice Crystal Scepter. Talon expecting the Ari to get killed with the last remaining rake after the Hourglass. Can't finish him off. Gets killed by uh, Braum, gets killed later in the end. And then now here, Talon is trying to salvage something. Kha'Zix gets a W heal, and or he gets a, what's that called? A dangerous, dangerous game. game. Dangerous he gets game. A dangerous That's right. Game. It is a dangerous game. So that does, it does beg the question, uh, when you're balancing a team in terms of your own champion picks, you ha you've overloaded yourself with these, these melee champions. And... In a team fight, at, you know, at what point is that going to be too costly? Because you can't, you no longer have the gap closers when you did need to assassinate somebody, and now you're just kind of running for your life and scrambling for pickup kills. I think the most important thing is you can run a, a team comp like that, absolutely, but you need to be exceptional at vision because you can't be the ones that is lacking in vision like that fight happened because they're just going to be able to retreat constantly, and you're going to be not only struggling to jump to them, but you're going to be struggling to just find them so that you got two things at hand before you can even get a fight going but if you control the vision and you have them try to chase you or like kind of cautiously check brushes you're gonna have a really easy time picking people off and jumping them because they don't know where you are and you're melee so you can actually basically get them to face check a brush and you can pick them off but they really struggle to get their vision control and they suffered for it by taking these fights that were clearly in the favor of gambit yeah and i'd just like to say that picking bands you can play a comp like that, but it's not optimal. You had an option to pick a Syndra, and your comp won't be so binary. That comp, you're playing four melees, and there's no poke on that comp. You have to just hard engage, run at people, and try to kill them. You don't want to pick that into a rise, ideally. Into a rise thresh, that's not the smartest option. If you go for the Syndra there, you at least have like same type of pick potential, but you have more range. You have opportunity to pick your fights a lot better instead of just having a Brahmolt flying at, at an Ari. Ari has a bunch of mobility and a Lantern. That's not the situation you want to put yourself in. You want to get your draft in a spot where you have a higher chance to win, not a, a spot where you can win if you play it perfectly. Yeah, I like that idea. And and one final note, I think, to point out for SK is I would really love to see them play a game where they don't do something at level one. Because I feel like their over-aggression, their, their uh, desire to make a play and get ahead and put themselves in a great position has backfired now a couple times, and, and, it's, and it's working against them ultimately. I think the level one they did the first game was fine. They just sat in the brush and waited for Gambit to do something. That's kind of the same mentality they should go into the game. Like, look... Just wait for Gambit to come into us, and then we'll we'll make sure that we can punish them. They almost got a kill. If it wasn't for um, Gambit having an Elise to face check the brush, they might have face checked and gotten first blood for themselves. But they, by five man stacking that, you're not putting yourself in any risk. You'll have a big advantage by being a five man group and not having to move anywhere. But they invaded really deep as five, and they ended up paying for it. So either they do that, or they just do a five man point defense and just do a reactive like trade the trade size of the map. Just go for a standard level one. They proved that they could do uh, take a win off Gambit if nothing goes wrong level one. So they really just have to make sure that they can play it passive. And honestly, I just want to see them play like a point defense style. Use all your trinkets. Nothing happens level one. All right, let's take the game from there because that's honestly going to be the best gauge to see which team can come out ahead. 
I think they got game. mind game by game two because my they didn't do a proper point defense. They didn't have their trinkets at the right time, so they got invaded on. Their red buff was stolen in front of them. So I think in game three, they're like, all right, so let's do something aggressive. Instead of just doing a point defense where we might get screwed and they might not have uh, correctly identified what they did wrong in their point defense, they wanted to do something where it's like, okay, we invade, we get vision. If we're all five grouped together, we should be able to trade evenly. And that backfired too. So I think right now they're in a really bad spot for the level ones because they don't know if they should point. They don't know if they need to invade. They don't know how to get an even level one, which is really what they want. Well, so we'll see if they can diagnose those early problems in game four. Gambit are, though, just one game away from locking up their spot in the LCS. After a quick break, we'll jump into game four versus SK Prime to see if they can get it done. Oh, yeah. Stay with us. That's right. Finally, King shows up. There's nothing, but here's this fight. Four man. Dragon fight. In goes these. Edward will go down. The shark doesn't matter. Now Kuban also gonna fall. Zaiden holds the front line for as long as he can. But Mini J is about to fall. What the fuck? Also getting chased down. So much damage comes out from Kuban. Nick got away, and Smitty J. He's trying to do the same. Charm doesn't hit. Oh, go back in. in goes What the Fox. Doesn't do enough, though. There's the kill for Nick. An ace for Gambit. What the Fox in the wings. Will he try to fight this? Goes he in is. for his time, and he is oh. not on the right target. He gets exploded. Down goes the talent. Fight begins. Smitty J dies in the middle of the front line as well. 